Uh, welcome to the Full FX Disruptor video series with Elmax Group. Um, over the course of three videos, David Mercer and I, CEO of Elmax Group, are going to do something weird. I would like to say we're unaccustomed to doing, but we're going to be disagreeing about things, we'll be arguing about things, and we will be agreeing about things as well. But the common theme is going to be, um, where is disruption happening in our world? And it's going to go across crypto and FX. So, David, great of you to join me. Really looking forward to the next this series as we progress through it. Um, let's get into, I guess, the crypto world first of all, which I think is you know, is the hot topic here. I mean, LMAX Digital, you know, you're seeing continued new peaks in volume. I'll get your sales patch in for you early. Um, <laughs> which is, I mean, evidence to me that the crypto world is maturing. And, you know, there are, you know, there seems to be more of a structure, structure forming. What do you think are the interesting structural developments out there at the moment in crypto land? Yeah, good to, good to be here, Colin. Look, it's, it's a thrilling environment, but it's still very nascent. So it, we're a long way from perfection. I mean, a lot of us old pros, if you like, are sort of scratching our head because you haven't got the plumbing in crypto that exists in traditional capital markets. You know, we take for granted aggregation, for example, in foreign exchange. We take for granted that you have clearing houses. You take for granted you have prime brokers. You take for granted that anybody can trade foreign exchange effectively and likewise if you look at the futures market if you want to buy a gold future it's entirely possible crypto is not there so i i rather tritely call it the abc of crypto adoption banking and credit um, adoption is happening i think elmax digital is a barometer of that put simply colin elmax digital wouldn't exist if there was no institutional interest there's enough platforms out there covering retail customers. One you may well have heard of, you know, it's 56 million customers listed recently. You know, we have 500 institutional customers. So retail doesn't need LMAX Digital. Retail needs an institutional marketplace because we know that's what feeds everyone out there. So within the institutions, there's a lot of banks out there and, and you know, proprietary trading firms that are scratching their head because they don't have a clearer, they don't have a prime broker. So what's interesting on the B and C is banking and credit. Um, for a long time over the last decade, mm -hmm. if you said you were a crypto operation or a crypto hedge fund, your bank, be it Barclays, HSBC, JP Morgan, other banks are available, they may not open a bank account for you. Just say, no, we don't touch crypto. So that was a problem. How do you get fiat into the crypto systems? That was problem one. So we need better banks just to bank the operation. You know, there's two crypto-only banks, if you like, that have come to the fore, but they don't have the balance sheet of the names I mentioned. So that's a problem when you're talking asset managers and pension funds and, um, you know, the real money accessing the market. So at the moment, if you're a corporate treasurer, you actually have to open an account with a digital operation. What they really want to do is just use their existing channels. So... We need that banking. And then the last bit is credit, credit intermediation. A lot of us, again, we take it for granted. We, we ignore credit a lot in FX because it's taken care of. Yeah. Ah, I'm primed on by a bank. And I may or may not trade on LMAX Exchange or LMAX Digital. Or I might trade on one of those other exchanges you may have heard of in Chicago or London. But the access point is via a bank, again, through credit intermediation. So... That's going to open the floodgates. It's not there today. But when you see the press articles about A bank or B bank entering the market, that will open the channels for real money to come in. Then crypto will become a real asset class. Am, am I right, though, in thinking, I mean, because like yourself, I mean, I, I look at these announcements from the banks. and But it strikes me that what they're doing, actually, and, and this might be speaking to your um, point there, they're looking to be facilitators rather than what I would call a traditional market participant in the in the you know market maker market taker sense. Is that is that fair? I think that's fair. I think that's very fair today. It's almost 
they have to do it yeah. now. But by the way, they didn't have to do it three years ago. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, if you read the crypto evangelists out there, it's like, oh, you know, large bank A has to be in it. Well, they don't actually, because today the total market cap of crypto is, is about a uh, trillion dollars. Yeah. The market cap of gold is 10 trillion. As you and I well know, foreign exchange trades 7 trillion a day. So yeah. whilst there's a lot of noise about it, it wasn't that um, that much of, it wasn't that demanding. It, there wasn't that client demand. They didn't have to be in it. But now I think they do because some of their own customers are now taking money out of their bank accounts and opening with a crypto exchange because mm. they want to be long Bitcoin or Ethereum. So I think they need to, it's just that they need to facilitate it. Um, the head of one large bank recently said, yes, we need to be fearful of these fintechs because we need to hold on to our customers. And those customers traditionally do everything with that bank. You know, they buy equities, uh, they put money on deposit, they might do mortgages, they have some wealth management there. They might, you know, pick a few stocks and buy it through the bank. And now they're saying, hey, can you buy me some Bitcoin? So it is the facilitation. I don't think in the next year or two, you're going to see huge crypto market making divisions or proprietary trading desks in banks, but it will be somewhere. And then we'll watch it develop. When it becomes a very liquid product, when it goes 10x. So if yeah. you're talking a market cap of 10 trillion, so the size of gold, then I think you're going to truly say, yes, this is an asset class. And George over there is head of the crypto division. Mm. Today, it's still a small part and it is just about facilitating um, the growing client demand. I, I mean, I read something today somewhere that said like, um, I think to show, show off my crypto credentials, I call it Dogecoin, but Dogecoin um, yeah. has, has dropped 72 a billion dollars in market cap over the last month or so, which is twelve billion dollars more than Lehman. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, these numbers are quite big, you know. <laughs> it's, it's so you know if, if the institutions are tiptoeing into this world, I look at it and think to myself, I, I think there's a problem with the market structure when a tweet from a notoriously loose individual is moving the market. Have we got to solve yeah. that problem as well before these people come in? Yeah, look, I think some people, you know, um, some people need to be more responsible, especially when you've got a listed vehicle. Um, but maybe that's also a sign of the lack of liquidity or lack of depth in the market in that a tweet, a comment can move an asset class this much. I mean, is it's it a bit like, you know, if you're the CEO of that of that company and you said, "Oh, my cars are rubbish," then of course you're going to expect it to to move twenty or thirty percent, maybe fifty yeah. percent. But unfortunately, one individual is moving an asset class, and that's just because it is still predominantly a retail market, Colin. I mean, yep. you and I know the foreign exchange world. Everyone talks about retail and FX, but retail FX is fifteen to twenty percent of the market, eighty yep. percent institutional because people actually need foreign currency to do international yeah. trade. Yeah. Crypto, I would say today, is probably 90% retail. So yes, you're seeing you know, massive pumps and massive sell-offs because, because of a tweet and because it's retail-led. As the institutions come in, and you're seeing that, I think you saw that in the, the latest sell-off, it finds a flaw. Yeah. That resilience is institutional money saying, ah, I like it here. I am bid at 30. I'm not bid at 60,000, but I am bid at 30,000. That's the institutional money coming in. Yeah. But everything else in between is very retail led today. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in many ways you look at it and say, is crypto vulnerable to the same sort of thing as we saw with the, with the GameStop, you know, the mean stocks. <clears throat> but then the retail army that's actually targeting short sellers are going like, well, the last thing we really need is, is crypto going down. So they kind yeah, of... Really, but there is that vulnerability, isn't there? I guess that with so many retail traders, the price action is dictated to a degree by them. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And 
you know, one of the structural issues we need to discuss and address is is too much leverage in crypto. Like you know, if you're a sensible trader, you're not you're going to use very little leverage. I mean, I've got some of the biggest proprietary trading firms in the world trading on Almax Digital. I'll tell you that intraday they might use five to one leverage intraday. Yeah. Overnight, it's unlikely they're using any. They might use two to one. In retail land out there, so you hear about perpetual swaps, you hear about the futures, um, the sort of retail futures market. People are using hundred to one, which is just crazy. I mean, that's it's hardly if someone sells, I don't know, in the marketplace five million Bitcoin, five million dollars of Bitcoin. I'm sorry, you're going to be stopped out. So yeah. it's crazy. So there's this there's this um, gold rush to get access, but with people who actually don't have that much capital and they're using 100 to 1, 50 to 1. And then what you have is you have these death spirals. So when there is a gap or a good reason, for example, you know, China outlawing mining, um, someone investigating one of the large retail operators, there's naturally a sell off, but it's perpetuated because of the leverage. All those stops get triggered. So you see, typical markets, you know, things get oversold, but you're seeing gaps of, you know, 20%, 30% because of that, uh, the retail predominance. You'll be but in a way, it's a good thing for the market. When they get, when it gets flushed out and they realize there's no such thing as a free lunch, then we arrive at a much more orderly market of which we're familiar with. Because I, mean, I must, I was about to say there. You, um, you'll be pleased here. I've got a theory about this, because um, my theories are always infallible until they're not. But it strikes me that if we did see a continued decline in crypto, and we saw a blowout to the downside, that could actually be quite healthy for the industry, in my view, because it would weed, it would weed out those weaker players. It would instill a sense of responsibility into those that remain in crypto, and probably would increased demands for the sort of structure structure that you were talking about earlier on yeah now unfortunately colin i have to agree with you right so uh the, <laughs> on that the the blowouts so look people have short memories mm -hmm. um so we're sitting in 2021 you know bitcoin somewhere around thirty thousand. that's not a bad performance by the way uh, no. closed the year at 20, uh, twenty nine thousand. so Forget the 60,000 that, that, that was paid a, a month or two ago. Unless you're long. The short memory is it was 3,800 in March 2020 at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. And if you looked at the graph, it looked like it was going to zero. It didn't. It found the floor. That, for me, was a real sign that the market was here to stay because it showed resilience in a once-in-a-decade crisis. Yeah. I know it's a once-in-a-century pandemic, but, you know, every decade we can chart them. There's a crisis or other that really yeah, affects yeah. capital markets. Yeah. So I thought the resilience demonstrated in March 20 was phenomenal, was good for the market. I think this new level, this new level in uh, 2021, the 30,000 again shows resilience. And some of the fluff, some of the retail speculation um, will be eked out of the market. And like, I'm, I'm sorry that some individuals will have, lost money doing that um but overall we're now going to have a better marketplace for all and people understand that you know it's the, it's the warren buffett saying you know don't buy something for 10 minutes unless you wish to own it for 10 years yeah so i happen to be a big believer in in <clears throat> crypto i happen to be a big believer that it, that the technology can revolutionize certainly the back end of capital markets but it's not going to happen in 21 or 22 it's going to take another decade of growth yeah right you know it took us in the fx market you know banker stat happened in 1978 it took 24 years for there to be a central clearing system to solve that um i think crypto will be a bit quicker than that mm -hmm. um but certainly it, it, it's evolving and it's the more institutional players that come in um, the better market it will be for everyone, all segments of the market, retail and institutional, and the bigger banking names entering the space can only be good. I hope, of course, we want to be successful in the space, but I hope our digital um, 
can be part of the ecosystem and help develop a more orderly market for all. Yeah, okay. Um, is one of the things then to get these uh, institutions involved, do we need to sort of develop a, I, I guess, a, a, a funding market behind it? I.e., you know, I bought, I, you know, I bought Bitcoin at 50,000. Oh dear, I'm having a very bad year, but it's okay because I've got carry. Yeah. At the moment, we don't. Correct. I think, so it exists in crypto. So the crypto evangelists out there, I'll say, David, David, you can do it. You go into DeFi and you can stake it. And there's contango in the market. You know, I can sell the future up high and I can buy it spot. Yeah, that exists. It yeah. does exist. There is carry, but with the carry comes a lot of credit risk. So be aware of the credit. There's no such thing as a free lunch. It's also very credit intensive. So you can trade a future with a well-known name, but you're not getting much leverage on it. And you can buy the spot with LMAX Digital, but there's no leverage. It's one-to-one, -one, so it's really quite expensive. And you can get a yield of six to eight. There isn't yet, Colin, a stock borrowing and lending market, a repo market of which we're familiar. It's coming, and again, it will be provided by the bigger names, right? It's people that are holding it on the balance sheet and just want to earn something from it. Yeah. At the moment, unfortunately, most of you, most of us, would buy a Bitcoin and put it in the vault and earn nothing for it and hope that we get some capital appreciation. Certainly, again, that will unlock the wheels. That will bring more institutional money, mm. right? That will, someone saying, hey, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a long only fund. I've got a billion dollars of Bitcoin, earning nothing. I'll lend it out to you. You're a good yeah. AAA name, and you're going to pay me six or eight percent on that, which is yeah. which is a good yield today. So, yeah. and yes, that needs to develop, um, and it's like I guess coming to coming to a bank near you soon. Mm. Okay, so one other thing I just wanted to get into um, before we close out. Um, my sense is that the world central banks are getting more aggressive in their uh -huh. messaging. Um, they've been very proactive around promoting central bank digital currencies. And mm -hmm. with that is coming some inferred criticism of the crypto yep. world. Yep. Is this a threat to the crypto landscape? And I guess actually I'm interested from your point of view as LMAX group. Yeah. Is it is it a, an opportunity for like yeah. a provider like yourself? Absolutely. So the two different things, right? So again, I think central bank digital currencies are a good thing for the market, right? To just digitize everything we use. Yeah. Probably in a decade from now, two decades, you won't know what a pound note looks like. I see pound notes haven't existed for 20 years, but anyway, you won't know what a five pound note looks like. Um, because everything's digital. You know, you and I probably think, because we can tap and go on our phone, we think yeah. it's digital already. Uh, but in fact, the real clearing is taking two days. So I think it's a, it's a good step for the central banks. Um, not quite sure of the use case yet. I mean, the example they used in the United States was um, getting welfare checks out or the pandemic checks, right? Imagine the furlough scheme we had, getting money into the population's hand more quickly, and more efficiently. Right. You know, with that, there's some privacy concerns. I mean, that's really what you'd be concerned with, you know, why should we be concerned? But at the moment, if you run around with $100 in your pocket, no one's telling you how to spend it or no one knows where you've spent it. If you want to spend it on a racetrack or in a casino, you're at liberty to do that. I guess the privacy concern is that Big Brother's watching you. So that's yeah. the downside of it. But I think it's inevitable. Um, again, it will ease the wheels um, of the crypto asset class. So LMAX Group today, I'd say, would be a very good on-ramp into crypto. So what does that mean? I've got 160 bank accounts. I've got Nostros in 20 different currencies. So if you want to send me krona or peso or pounds or dollars or yen, you can do. I'll do the FX for you if you want dollars. Why do you want dollars? Well, because I want to buy Bitcoin and the best market is Bitcoin dollar. It's not Bitcoin peso. Yeah. So I've got the fiat on ramp for you. So that's helpful. And then I've got the digital operation 
so I can give you access to the crypto market. So for me, I see it as an access point. And then the, uh, the hard bit is actually getting access to say something in DeFi. Unfortunately, you can't send dollars into DeFi right now. Like back to my B problem, not enough banks doing it. So again, you'd come to Armex Digital and say, David, can you, can you buy me some Ether? Because the whole DeFi world is mostly powered by Ethereum today. So then you have your Ethereum and you can exist in the decentralized finance world. So I see it as an opportunity. I think at the moment, you know, um, the central bank digital currencies can become the stable coins of which there are many, but you don't know the backers. You might be happy, happier with a stable coin that is the Fed or yeah. the Bank of England. You may not. By the way, if you're a crypto evangelist out there, don't shoot me. I know you believe we can get rid of all those authorities and we should just trust each other's um, central country. But I think it's an, it's, an, it, it, it's an additional lever. I happen to think DeFi can transition capital markets. And if nothing else, Colin, capital markets moving seven days a week is an inevitability of the next decade. It's happening in crypto today. I think that's a better service, a better utility for everyone. And certainly as a simple exchange operator, I like the fact that my infrastructure um, can be an operation yeah. on a Saturday and Sunday. It's yeah. not sitting there getting dusty and, and costing me money on Saturday and Sunday. So I think that's a good thing. Um, DeFi itself is just at the very, very start. We have to accept there's going to be some errors along the way. It's growing. And I happen to think a bit like the central bank digital currency thing, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the experiments in DeFi and in crypto will feed back into traditional capital markets. And yeah. then both existing capital markets and new capital markets will benefit from those experiments and those innovations. We have agreed on way too much in this conversation. So very quickly, Agreed. Bitcoin, up or down? Oh, oh, oh. Look, I'm it's arranging... It's 32,000. Over the next six months, would you be a buyer or seller? Uh, I'd average in, Colin. <laughs> so you'd be a buyer. Look, I'd be at... Look, I'm, I'm, I'm a buyer of Bitcoin. Right. Look, Elmax Group, it's out there. <laughs> we have X percent of our balance sheet in yeah. crypto. We will have for the future. I treat it as I treat euros and, and sterling. Yeah. I, I think certainly three years from now, it will be north of here. You might see, I wouldn't be surprised if it prints at 20,000 this year, um, which wouldn't be a horror show from closing the year 29,000. Why do you damn as a one-armed economist? <laughs> you saw me as a, you saw me, as, I'm a research analyst, but look, no, if you really, if you held a gun to my head, uh, I'm, I'm a buyer of Bitcoin particularly. Okay. Right, in that case, I'll be a seller. So at least we can disagree on something and it's cool. David, thanks for your time. Cherry and FX trader. Exactly, yeah. Thanks for your time. And I look forward to uh, the next in our series.